Well, hey, podcast listeners, in episode 59 of the Pixar Post podcast, we're going to welcome the podcast back into the fold, uh, starting with our interview series for, from our trip to Pixar to discuss and dive into The Incredibles 2. Yes, that's right. We were out there for the uh, press event where we dive into all the different sessions where they talk about how they made the story, how they designed the house, how they did this, and all of so on and so forth. <laughs> Everything and, Incredibles 2. Correct. Yeah. And we'll talk about all those different things. So... Um, I think the first little bit of Pixar news that we'll kind of jump into is that if you haven't seen the Incredibles 2 toys that are out there, the Disney Store just released theirs actually on Saturday, uh, which was actually ahead of schedule. And our theory is that was released ahead of schedule because of Toys Toys R Us. Us. Yeah, because they released theirs early. Uh, And so we think it's really more of a play of like, uh uh-oh, they broke shelf date because the Disney Store always releases first. Yes. Um, But... That didn't happen this time because Toys R Us is like, who cares? They're, we're selling it. Yeah, they're going out. They're clearing out their warehouses, so they're putting everything they have right. on the shelves. Right. So and if you have... it's funny because Walmart and Target followed suit pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, because we were actually at Target yesterday, yeah. and they had, and we're recording this on uh, Sunday evening. It'll be released Monday when you're listening to this on the April sixteenth. Um, but uh, yeah, so they did the same thing. So this wasn't none of this was supposed to be out till May. So it's interesting that they're just doing that early. Right. (laughs) Um, But the other bit of news, too, is actually uh, R. Lee Emery. I believe that's how you pronounce his last name. E-M-R-E-Y, I believe. I believe. Uh, Was, uh, I think his most famous role was Full Metal Jacket, which is not a children-friendly movie, if you've ever seen that. Uh, But he voiced the the sergeant in the Green Army Men troop, if you Mm -hmm. will, that was, uh, you know... Sir, toy, yes, sir! In the Toy Story series. Yeah, he was always very, you know, serious and would he be like, oh, okay, at ease, at ease. Um, but he actually passed away at age 74 from complications with pneumonia that was announced by his longtime manager. So that was actually kind of a bummer. You know, it's unfortunately with the Toy Story franchise, there's been a lot that has touched that mm-hmm. as far as between Slinky Dog and now Potato Head and... And the yes. sergeant right. uh, as well. I I can't remember can't remember if there was anybody else that was part of that. Yeah, I just uh, Joe I mean, Ramft. I, I guess Ramft, you could say well, yeah. that with Wheezy. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think of you know Doc, Cars right. franchise, but right. Yeah, and then Mirage from Incredibles. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just another sad passing. Um, that uh, hopefully that doesn't affect the Toy Story gang too much. I doubt it because technically they. He parachuted out in Toy Story 3 and said it's, you know, it's been an honor serving with you. Right. So I don't think that'll affect anything with Toy Story 4. But how we can transition this a little bit with the news is that, uh, pardon the hiccup that I just had there, (laughs) uh, is that actually with uh, Toy Story 4, we'll learn a touch about that in the main focus of our uh, podcast today, which is going to be the interview that we had with Brad Bird, uh, who's the writer-director and Nicole Paradis Grindle. Correct. Yeah, not Toy Story 4. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Nicole Grindle and John Walker, who were the producers for Incredibles 2. And in that, in the interview, one of the things that Brad touches on is that, uh, you know, why did somebody, how did, how did they move up and how did Toy Story 4 move back? Mm-hmm. And uh, he gets into some really good insights there. Essentially, just to give you a high level here, since I brought it up and I don't want you to go, ugh. Yeah. Uh, was that he said that they were a little further along in their development and Toy Story 4, he said, was taking a lot of twists and turns and they didn't know where they were going to land. So it essentially sounds like they were having troubles and he was like, they asked him, "Can can you bump it up? And he said, sure, I can do that. So it was really like a how are we going to make this happen? Mm -hmm. And what's funny is, is throughout the, the sessions that we had, and we'll talk more about this in our posts and more in the podcast coming up too. But in these sessions, he t- they talked about the fact that they had to do a lot of things differently than they used to. For instance, they usually always do a full color script, uh, which is where they just draw like the, they always display it in the art of books as like that's the thumbnail drawings where it shows you just how the color kind of changes in the tone throughout the movie. Yeah. Real basic drawings and Ralph Eggleston was going to do these in the similar fashion to how he did them on Inside Out, but they didn't have time. So they only color scripted a few scenes and then the rest are really just storyboard drawings that they took to the next level. Um, but yeah, this they, they 
did a lot of things differently. And uh, you'll hear Brad and Nicole talk about the fact as well that they think sometimes that uh, when people's backs are against the wall, sometimes that means that it's things come out better because you have to make a decision and just go with it. Yeah, quicker. Yeah. But Brad also talks about the frustrations of that, which was super cool too, where he talks about the fact that sometimes it drove him nuts when he wanted to dive deeper into an element or of a story Mm -hmm. and he couldn't because how do I, I can't hammer it out. I don't have time to figure it out. I just know that it doesn't work right now. So I got to already take a turn. Interesting. Yeah. So how was it being in the room with him? Because I know you are such a fan of his work. Yeah. And it, it was different than any other Pixar director that we've sat with before. The vibe in the room was different. Not just with me, mm-hmm. the vibe in the room. Like, pin drop before he walked in. Wow. And he was a couple minutes running behind, and the conference room we were in was in the upper level, and you could see one of the two, like, catwalks or bridges that are... Okay, see, similar to how when I was there for Coco. Okay, you, okay. You could see you were, it was kind of like a middle conference room overlooking the atrium. Yep, exactly. Yep. And you could see him all of a sudden walking across with his like oh, wow. press escort and everybody started being like, oh, he's coming, he's coming. <laughs> it was, it was that's, different. That's kind of a cool lead up. That's kind of like a rock star entrance. It was almost. a total rock star entrance. He just walked in and he had a moderator and they said essentially, you know, like questions go. And the lady that was the moderator started just pointing at people. And she would say, you, you, you. Um, She was from the PR team, Mm -hmm. but it was essentially very well laid out. But it was, it was a little bit of a, we're talking different in a sense that he's done so much. Mm -hmm. Like you can't not know when you're looking at him that he's done hand-drawn animation direction, feature film direction, and 3D animation direction. Well, live action feature films. Correct. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So live action, hand-drawn animation, 3D animation. Yeah. Feature films. Correct. It's crazy. And the fact that he's kind of come in to be, for lack of better words, the cleaner on Mm -hmm. Ratatouille, uh, where he came in and and did that. You'll also hear some great insights in this interview about Ratatouille and how their back was against the wall with that one, too. And they got it done in a year and a half, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, well, we'll talk more about it after. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it was just, it was definitely... It felt different. It was definitely rock star-ish where you're like, you know, see you see a concert and you're like, oh my gosh, that is so-and-so on stage right now. Mm-hmm. And I've been listening to their music for years. And that's not to say that I wasn't star truck, starstruck with Pete or Jonas, Pete, uh, Pete Doctor or yeah. Jonas Rivera when I sat literally knee to knee with Pete right. as we were in a big square, uh, t- you know, big square set up of tables. That was also like insane for me Mm -hmm. knowing how early of an animator he was to the company and the films that he's done I mean I don't know I I look at I look at Pete and I just see this gigantic great creative mastermind that really dives into his craft and creates this story that's drawn from true life Mm -hmm. and I respect him for that um in some ways more than Brad Mm -hmm. but when you think about Hollywood, it feels more Brad than Pete. Okay. Because Pete, when you walk in, we walked in and like I said, it's this big square table and he's like, sit anywhere. And he's immediately like, hey guys, how's it going? He wanted to get to know us. Like it was a different experience. It's a different vibe. It was a different vibe. I, uh, Pete also was in his like signature white t-shirt with like a button, a button up it, plaid. Yeah. yeah. He always has that, which is fantastic because that's like that's my total look. look. Yes. <laughs> Um, but you know, every time you see Brad too, he's just got the t-shirt with the, the black Black sports, the black blazer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sometimes the hat, sometimes not, you know, it's, he's, he's definitely got more of that. And Pete is such a cartoon character too, Mm -hmm. that you just, I don't know. You just want to hug him. Mm -hmm. He's, I don't, I don't know. But I mean, I, 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 I've, like I said, I've talked to other directors too, um, Actually, have I? Because, uh, oh yeah, with uh, yeah. Brian Fee, too. But it just still isn't the same. It wasn't the same. Bri- uh, Brian Fee gave a different vibe than Pete Doctor did, too. Yeah. Of course they're all going to give a different vibe. Well, they're, they're all individual different. people. Yeah. But there was just, there's a mystique around Brad. 
I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's, it, it was really cool. And Nicole, Nicole Paradis Grindle, the producer, and John Walker, very uh, welcoming as well. You can tell from their face. They're very happy. You know, they're very warm and welcoming people. Um, John and Brad worked on Tomorrowland together as well. So they've actually done a live action feature, mm-hmm. um, which I thought was cool to, to carry that relationship forward. Um, so I thought that was cool. Yeah. Um, anyways, I'm looking over some of my notes here. So the other thing I should talk about too, is that, um, of course there's going to be some spoilers in here. You know, that's inevitable if we're talking about what went into the making of a film. So if for some reason you're trying to avoid those things, then I, I'm sad to say that, you know, you should probably turn it off, but (laughs) nothing is that. Nothing is plot driven there's some stuff okay um but to be honest brad bird is so secretive I was gonna say he's so secretive that he doesn't really give away yeah i mean on, on tomorrowland there was rumors that he took all the staff's phones and you wouldn't let him to bring them on set any day to get any leaked images um he, yeah he's it, it you can feel his influence on the marketing that's been out there so far even what we saw from the film we screened the first 22 minutes and then watched three or four four other clips that were maybe like two Scattered to four throughout. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. But still towards the beginning because we didn't see anything else about, uh, the wannabe Ugh. supers. Okay. Um, we, we are going to be doing a post about that, which if you're listening to this and you haven't seen that, go back to pixarpost.com. It'll be right there on one of our lead images, but it's about the wannabe supers. Um, he didn't talk about, and you'll hear my question that I ask him about the vocal booth, mm-hmm. uh, and who like knocked it out of the park from the old group and the new group. And he was careful enough to not reveal anybody that hadn't already been revealed: Catherine Keener, Bob Odenkirk, Sophia Bush, of the new people. Mm-hmm. So he knew exactly what he was doing at all times. He, he, he so, anyways, you're not going to hear anything that's too major, but I just want to at least preface it that there's still going to be some of that in there. But the interview, um, you're going to hear awesome stuff about Will Honey, Frozone's wife, be in the movie, um, and, a, and a couple other things. I, where I want to kind of shift to now is just before we play the interview, is just recap a little bit of the trip. Um, I'll dive into more details, but just so to give you a flavor of what else is coming uh, from the trip as well. Sound like an okay idea? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Um, so the first night that we were out there, this is just a couple weeks ago from April 16th. So yeah, I mean, it was, it was quick. a quick, yeah. Usually sometimes the embargo is like a month or so out, mm-hmm. but this is a quick one. So it started with us getting to the studio at 6 PM, pretty standard for how these events go. Uh, one of the first things you do after you check in is you kind of wander by the store. <laughs> the store is closed at that point. The Pixar studio store, which is just, you know, again, for employees and guests, uh, it's closed, but I of course have to peek in and see what I'm looking at. And I'm starting to go scanning around and I stop and I say, oh my goodness, I see a Holy Grail item for us. Yes. Something we've been looking for for years. Right. Which is the wooden Toy Story. Knickknack knick, bank. I shouldn't say Toy Story, but the wooden knickknack bank. Yes. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, this oak kiln dried snowman snowman bank that you (laughs) when you put coins in his tie his tie yeah you put it in his top hat but his tie swivels when you his scarf Mm -hmm. swivels when you put it in and it's just always been super cool and cute and anything related to the shorts we love especially early shorts knickknack which is awesome Mm -hmm. so we were able to pick that up uh side side note on the way home, there was an awesome story that we tweeted about that I got stopped at airport security going through <laughs> with that knickknack bank yes. because they were like, excuse me, sir, is this your bag? And I'm like, yes. They're like, we're going to need to see, search all your stuff. And I was like, oh, OK, why? And they're like, uh, do you have a uh, wooden hollow snowman that you're traveling <laughs> with? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> and they're like, why do you have that at this time of year? Yeah. And so that's, I mean, that's a legit question. Yeah. I I mean, I props to the TSA because I mean, they're doing their job right there, but it is funny. And when you told it to me, when you called me and told me that story at the airport, I just kind of giggled. I mean, you could just help but laugh. Right. 
Um, but you have a good rest of your story. Yeah, so essentially they start opening it up and they're really confused by everything they're seeing. They're like, there's all this stuff that says Pixar and Incredibles 2 and Notebooks and they're just, what, what is going on? And I'm like, well, in case it's not obvious, I'm like, I just left the Pixar and I was at the Incredibles 2 like press reveal event. And so the girl's like, wait, wait. Really? And then the whole tone changes. It was no longer I was a psycho traveling with a hollow wooden bank. Yeah, you're... It was uh, a snowman bank yeah. in in April. It was that I had been out there. And so then they're starting to piece it all together. They're like, okay. And they're like, the, like wondering why I have like a voice recorder and all these other things. So all of it's starting to come together. Mm-hmm. And so they can see that I'm not crazy. Yeah. Uh, um, but it was just funny because at the end, you know, as I was telling her like little insights that I was able to share she's she's literally rubbing her arms and she's like I'm getting chills she's like I can't wait to see it when does it come out so I'm like June 15th so yeah it was kind of fun that was a nice little side story that that came from it Mm -hmm. um but uh yeah I was lucky the next day when the store opened that I was able to get one because there were two and I found out that when I went in there they only had the one on display left somebody had just bought the other one right before me and so I was sweating it. Um, so anyways, we go in and the, pretty much the first thing you do that night is you get whisked into the theater, which if you haven't heard me talk about the theater before, I'm not going to go into a whole big thing about it, but it's like the best movie theater you've ever been to because they have to make sure that it's completely accurate in sound and color and all these other things. And the experience is great. They're wider seats, they're maple armrests, and the seats are this nice plush uh, maroon red velvet and the, it's just great. Of course, the lights then dim when they're going to start after Nicole Grindle and John Walker came out to introduce it real quick that they said what we're going to see. The the lights dim. The ceiling has, of course, stars on it with shooting stars. And then the crickets go. And then the red velvet curtain opens. And then the movie starts. No previews. Nothing. No, like, come get, you know, M&Ms at the front desk. None of that. It's great. So we watch the, the film, of course, uh... I will say that a lot of times at these screening events, the people that are there are critic film writers. I mean, mm-hmm. these are people that, you know, we've got other big name sites that are there. We're probably the lower on the totem pole well, yeah, in terms of, you know, we're talking about Entertainment Weekly, IMDb, big sites mm-hmm. um, that, that cover all media. All, all films. Correct. All films, not just Pixar. Like, you know, luckily we're included in that group because we center on on Pixar but um when uh I just lost my train of thought here um what was I saying you you were watching it so what oh yeah yeah so what the difference is is that typically when I've been to these screenings when the jokes are happening on the screen people aren't really laughing It's it's also a small group so yes. it's not like you're seeing it with like a theater of several hundred people. No, it's like maybe 30. Yeah, it's people. like 30, 30, something like, yeah, it's around 30. Um, but usually the jokes are you're like, huh, you don't know how the audience is going to react to it. Um, when things are happening, people are quiet because they're analyzing it. Mm-hmm. They're not just watching it for entertainment value. They're analyzing it to write a post later about it. Mm-hmm. And so this, I can tell you that of any of the screenings that I've been in, shorts or full features at Pixar, there's never been more reactions and laughter than there has in the first 22 minutes. Wow. Um, That, coupled with the fact that I've mentioned it before on our Hangouts on YouTube Live and in our posts, I believe maybe, not, not on the podcast, but... This is, I believe, a a billion dollar movie worldwide. I think if Finding Dory has reached it, um, other films, you know, like Toy Story three, mm-hmm. I I believe that this is also a billion dollar release. So I think it'll be the third Pixar film that's crested that mark. Interesting. It, it, because I think I've also said it too that our website. All the posts oh, that we do yes, about Incredibles everything. 2 are 25 to 40% higher in hits yes. than they are for anything else that we've done. Mm-hmm. So I think we've got a billion dollar movie on our hands combined between the hits and... Even though Coco was close. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely worldwide. Yeah. I mean, what you're... Oh, you mean as far as hits or yeah, as far as hits. dollars? Hits. Okay, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because dollars, it was a little shorter worldwide, but mm-hmm. uh, regardless, it was still uh, up there. Um, So anyways, we see the movie, loved it. I'm not going to reveal too much here, but 
holy cow, action packed, <laughs> um, humorous, just the shots and the selections, the layout, the think the decisions they made are insane. I mean, it's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And right after you come off of Coco, you think you can't see a more visually gorgeous movie. And it's not from the sense that it's not as bright and colorful and vibrant as Coco, because of it's course it's not. But the detail seems amped up. Okay. The detail in the characters' faces and everything. And I know part of that is because we're used to seeing them from before and then now. Right. Um, but that was great. Um, we screened Bao after that, which I can't say anything about that now, but more to come within mm-hmm. the next week. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, that it's, uh, it's a cute short. Um, so after that, we left there, everybody's awestruck and just like, you know, jaws dropped and, and we're like going, no, when it stops inside out was like, it was quiet when we were watching that because I think people were just taking it all in, mm-hmm. um, like traditional Pete films, it builds and builds and builds as it goes. And then this one is Brad hit you with the action right, right away. away. Um, so it's cool. Um, yeah, so we had our reception, like a little dinner reception with a whole bunch of Asian food that was inspired by Bao, Mm -hmm. um, since it is of, uh, Chinese heritage. Um, so we had that over there, which was, uh, in the Brooklyn building, which was nice. It's always nice to go to their different buildings because the screenings are in the Steve Jobs building, the main building. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I ended up just talking that evening with, uh, Domi Shi and the Bao team, which was really nice, um, to be able to get some pre-insights before I then saw heard another session with them the next day and had a one-on-one interview which by the way was like maybe my smoothest one-on-one interview I've ever had <laughs> um th- so we go home that night we go to our hotel the next morning we come back uh, bright and early seven o'clock in the morning um started our sessions with a little breakfast um and then just to give a sprinkling of some of the other sessions that you're going to hear on the podcast and on our site with posts. There's one with the production team about creating the worlds of the film, the anatomy of an action scene with the animation and some of the uh, layout team. There's a wardrobe of the film. There's one about Jack Jack. And then we also took a tour of the brand new Pixar archives, which I'll save that for a full post and podcast episode of everything we heard and saw. But wow. And I recorded the audio walking through and talking with them. Um, They said we could use it. And I was just like, okay, please. (laughs) I know a lot of it's going to be visual, but I'll see if I can still use it for the podcast. Um, But I did, all these are recorded uh, for the audio. And then we had a lot of one-on-ones. And then I also had a, uh, even a fun activity that we did while I was there where I created a, my own superhero character. So Mm -hmm. they had like a whole bunch of construction paper and scissors and glue and all these other things. And they said, keep it simple. So I didn't know what else to think. So I started channeling you (laughs) and I came up with that. You like sharks so much that I came up with one called red shark. And so essentially he walks like on his like hind legs and he, his arms, he has long or longer arms, generate shark teeth that are all like coned around and layered like shark teeth are, mm-hmm. like how they're like so many different rows back that they have them. And so as he hits people, they go shattering off and like they regenerate like shark teeth do. Um, it's very creative. <laughs> it, you don't sound like you like it. <laughs> it's an interesting idea. And then he can like grind down things with them too. Like he can like drill holes oh, into geez. things with them. Yeah. Oh, that's intense. It's a red shark. Yeah. He's a, he's a intense fighter. Yeah. But I was there and I was all thinking about supers and I'm like, okay, superheroes and villains. And so I kind of went the villainy, villainy route. route. Yeah. yeah. He's going to be a red shark. He's going to, and then it, I just thought it'd be a cool visual too, that when you punch uh, when you hit something with the the arms with the shark teeth, that they would go shattering and flying off all over the place. So visually, I was thinking it would kind of work. Mm-hmm. Even though you don't like it, it's all right. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, all in all, though, it was, as you would expect, magical. Um, I ran into many people that we know and have talked to on this podcast before. So just a high level, Kelsey Mann, Danny Ariaga, Cat Hicks, Alan Barilero, Mark Andrews, which if you follow us on social media, you saw I posted a picture of, um, and, and many more that we'll discuss as well. So I think I've set it up enough. Why don't you see, why don't you say we get into it and actually play the interview with Brad Bird, Nicole Grindle, John Walker. Sounds good. Sure. I'm Nicole Grindle. I am Brad Bird. And John Walker. 
Um, so we've heard a lot today about how little time a lot of departments have making this movie. I wonder if you could explain the kind of constraints. I would, except there's no time. <laughs> Next question. Next question. <laughs> and also, like, why did it work out that way? Uh, you know, we often shift, uh, not, I wouldn't say often, but it has happened a number of times. Um, the original uh, Incredibles was supposed to be after Cars. We were, it was going to be Nemo, Cars, Incredibles, and uh, our reels came together a little earlier than Cars did, um, so we moved up. And uh, the same situation happened here with Toy Story 4. Um, they've been going a number of different directions in story, and it was uh, concluded that we were a little further along than they were, so we moved up. Um, uh, so, so that was a challenge for us, but the studio is three times bigger than it was during Incredibles. So we actually... If we didn't choke, we could actually theoretically get the movie made, and then that is what came to pass. And I would just add that it can be a real benefit to the production to be under some amount of pressure. Uh, obviously, it was very intense for this team, as you've heard from them, but um, having worked here in a number of films, I can tell you when there's that kind of schedule intensity, people really rise to the occasion, and I sometimes think they even do better work. Yeah, when I got involved with Ratatouille, it was a little over a year and a half between my involvement and the finished film. And, you know, we only retained two lines of dialogue and two shots from all of the previous versions that had been done. So, so we had, it was like running in front of a, uh, a train laying down track in front of a moving train and, and uh, like Wallace and Gromit. And, uh, uh, but, you know, as Nicole said, that everyone rallied and as long as it's clear where we want to go, um, people rise to the occasion. Um, I was hoping you guys could talk about the decision to set the film at the moment that the original <clears throat> did and any of the courses or options that you guys considered at the beginning. Um, I thought about aging everybody the way everybody does, and then I thought, no, that sucks. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, that's about as deep as it went. No, what it is is uh, the uh, one of the conceits of the original film is that... Um, I tried initially when I was first starting to work on the project long before Pixar or anything like that. It was even, I think, before Iron Giant when I first had the idea. Um, I went to a comic book shop and thought, I've got to think up new powers. And after about a half an hour in the comic book shop, I realized every power has been done by somebody, somewhere, even if it's only self-published 100 issues in Ohio. Uh, <laughs> everything has been done. And then I, then I, right after that, a little epiphany, I realized I'm not very interested in the powers. That's not the part that interests me. What interests me is the idea of having a family and, and um, having there be a reason to hide the powers. And uh, once I had that insight into what I wanted to do, I picked the powers based on who they were in the family. And so men are always expected to be strong, so I had Bob have super strength. Uh, women are, uh, mothers are always pulled in a, a million different directions, so I had her be elastic. Teenagers are insecure and defensive, so I had Violet have force fields and invisibility. Uh, Ten-year-olds are energy balls that can't be stopped. Uh, and babies are unknowns. Maybe they have no powers, maybe they have all powers. We don't know. So that's what Jack-Jack was. He was seemingly the first normal one in the family and then at the end of Incredibles you find out that he's a wild card and that he's sort of a Swiss army knife of powers. And that to me reminds me of the way babies can grasp languages really easily and adopt them easily. So that idea changes if you age the characters up 
and, and the, uh, the insight into those periods of your life and those particular perspectives disappears once you age them up. I'm not interested in a, in a college age jack-jack. I'm just not. I'm interested in my sons, you know, uh, getting, you know, growing up. But um, in terms of uh, the interest for me in this movie, it stays more iconic if everyone kind of... Uh, situates themselves. I also was on the first eight seasons of The Simpsons, and that's worked out rather well for them. So, uh, yeah, I'll stick with that. So the first movie came out years before Disney bought Marvel, and before the birth of this Marvel Cinematic Universe. Can you talk about how this superhero movie renaissance has affected The Incredibles in any way? Well, it, 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 on some level, it's kind of like uh, going out to the football field and there's been way too many games on it, you know, and there's just kind of this dried dirt with a few <laughs> sprigs of grass and everything's kind of clunky and, you know, life doesn't grow there anymore. Um, <laughs> so there's that aspect uh, where you feel like, oh, Jesus, it's really been covered. Um, it it's kind of reminds me of the way Westerns were in the late 50s where if you had a television, 95% of what was on was a Western. Um, so we're in that phase a little bit, and it makes it very challenging uh, on a story level because um, not only do you have every superhero under the sun um, and cross-promoting films and blah, 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 but you also have a bunch of television shows. And, and you know, even years ago, uh, there was a show called Heroes with it, the... Uh, the creator of actually told me he it was a mashup of uh, the movies Crash and The Incredibles. He actually, he said he said I was influenced by that, and I thought if you melded Crash with The Incredibles, that's kind of what this is. But they used to go heroes used to do. Um, five, six, ten different superheroes with storylines that, that continued on every week. So you were doing, you know, quantum superhero stories every week, and it seemed like, you know, everything had been um, done. Um, but... Uh, so it's easy to freak out and go, well, why even try? Everybody's got everything done to death. But then, again, I return to what makes us unique, and it's this idea of a family and um, that superheroes have to hide their abilities. And, and those things actually are unique to us, and, and there's plenty left to explore. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and when we were trying to sell the idea of the first Incredibles, you know, one of the criticisms of it for, for was, well, what is it? Is it a family movie? Is it a spy movie? Is it a superhero movie? We know, well, what is it? What is it? You gotta pick one. And I think that's been the strength of, of the, of both the films is that they are all those things and, and that it isn't, it isn't rooted in just a superhero genre. Yeah. yeah. The first Incredibles was, to me, pretty much the perfect film. Uh-oh. I'm in trouble, perfect trouble, perfect trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, if I'd only left it there. <laughs> Everything I've seen of this one indicates it's going to be fantastic. Oh, good. But my question is, is that back then, um, diversity wasn't being discussed very much uh, in film. Now it's very much in, in you know, out on everybody's mind it should be. Um, but in the footage that I saw, I didn't see much of that left. The, well, it's in there. It's not in the sections that you saw. Okay. Um, it doesn't... Uh, uh, we uh, are just telling the story we want to tell. Um, you know, some people have remarked, because we've just started sort of talking about this, that, you know, oh, you know, we geared this towards the Me Too movement because it's got a female lead and all this stuff. And, and uh, um, you know, we were in production. I had that idea right on the heels of the first film. That's the oldest idea in this current movie, that and uh, exploring Jack-Jack's power. So we don't really respond to... Uh, this, uh, whatever the thing of the moment is, because our lead times are so long. We just kind of tell the stories we want to tell. But that said, you know, the first walk around character in Disneyland that was black is Frozone. Right. And so, you know, I think we've done okay, and, and we will continue to kind of present uh, that sort of world because that's the world that we live in. Okay, well, speaking for like black females, it would be nice to see that. 
uh, black female. <laughs> yeah, we have a few, but uh, yeah. we uh, we we uh, yeah. Should I say? Yeah. yeah well, well, okay. We we wanted to show honey in this See, movie. That's my dream. Yeah. Well, okay. We, we did. We didn't end up doing it because it's funnier as a voice. So we actually went through all the trouble of designing the character, and the design appears in the movie, but not as Frozone's wife. She's I in there. But... One today, just Did you? She was my superhero, honey. All right. Sweet, but wear her sting. Well, okay. I like it. Well, well done. Um, yeah. uh, we're actually looking for uh, new story uh, people. And... Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that sounds good. Uh, we do. Uh, we have used her design and she is a hero. There's not a lot of screen time though on it. So uh, the problem is is we have a lot of different things that we want the movie to be about and we're already you know the two Incredibles movies are already the longest movies at Pixar and they are never happy about that. Never. They're like oh what's your job waiting so long? You know and we're like well you got a lot we of stuff to put on the there. screen. We gotta get honey in somehow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and so that's our, our struggle but uh, you know I hope you like the, the new movie. Thank you. You made a joke out of uh, you should have left it there. How quickly did you tackle in finding the story for this one the fact that you have a bunch of people who love what you did in the original sort of the sequel uh, challenge of it? Um, I think that it's really distracting to think of that. Um, if you think about pleasing uh, an audience that has no definition, it's it's old, it's young, it's east, west, north, south, um, conservatives, liberals, you know, everyone in between, if you try to think about it pleasing that, and, and what will they like two years from now? I mean, you just will curl up into a fetal ball and, and never come out of your room. Um, if you the better way to think about it is I'm going into a darkened movie theater, the curtains are opening, and I'm seeing what? What do I want to see? And if you ask that question of yourself that way, you're always connecting with the person that wants to be told a story. And that to me is, is I can, I feel comfortable answering that question rather than what will audiences like, what will critics like, what did they like about the last one and do I do it again because they like it or do I try to surprise them? And, and the answer is a little bit of both. You want the characters to feel consistent. You want the world to feel consistent, but you don't want to be able to know what's going to happen next. So that's the challenge, and, and it's not an easy challenge to, to meet, but um, it's it, it definitely is your job if you're making films. Yeah, and the fact that we took 14 years to do it, you know, suggests that we take mm -hmm. we took the challenge seriously. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, the thing is, is that many sequels are cash grabs. And, you know, there's a saying in the business that I can't stand where they go, you don't make another one, you're leaving money on the table. You know, and it's like, ah, Jesus, you know, money on the table is not what makes me get up in the morning. Making something that people are going to enjoy a hundred years from now is what gets me up. So, so, uh, so if it were a crash grab, a cash grab, we, we would not have taken 14 years. You know, it makes no financial sense to wait this long. It's sheerly you know, we had a story that we wanted to tell. Uh, you, you had said uh, exploring Jack Jack's power was a big part of this movie. Were there any specific guidelines you gave the animation team, like, don't go this far with it, like, take limits? Really, the first uh, limitations would go to the story team. You know, um, when we were, when I was, you know, saying, "Here's this scene. Here's this scene." Now, you know, let's make, let's explore it visually. Um, and I didn't put a lot of limits on them initially, and so they started doing everything. <laughs> and um, uh, I think that we started to, to go. All right, one, we got to settle down a little bit. Uh, toward Act 3. We don't want to have any new powers in Act 3. And then we got into Act 3 and there were a few points where oh, it would be really cool <laughs> if we had to one no more new power here. And, and so we kind of told ourselves to stay strictly on our diet and we kind of broke it a couple of times. So uh, uh, No, we didn't have a lot of limitations. We tried to treat uh, this very unrealistic world, um, try to pepper in realism in terms of what 
what people think, how they react to having powers. He's presented as a baby. So what interests him is what interests a baby. It's, it's, he never understands what's going on and can anticipate the villain's move or whatever. It's more like, that's shiny. I like that. This makes me angry. You know, um, I want to go there. You know, I mean, it's, it's those kind of emotions. And then uh, you, you build the superpowers around that. So he's still a baby, even though he has these powers that he is, only has limited control over. Uh, we learned that there's some new superheroes introduced in this. Uh, we said they derive from the same type of, you know, kind of six E Silver Age influence that we see in the first one. Or, or Silver Age? Well, that's kind of the comic book term. Oh, I don't know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> you could say anything now, and I'd believe you. You know, <laughs> you know, right before the rubber era. You know, and I'd go, oh wow, it was the rubber era. I got to yeah. bone up. Uh, yeah, that's probably later. Uh, but we'll, we'll <laughs> The same uh, type of, of uh, standard for the superheroes, uh, or a little bit more uh, across the map in terms of what kind of uh, influence those characters. Boy, I don't know. I would say that the movie has a, a sort of a late uh, 50s, early 60s aesthetic, and that we've tried to stay with that. Um, it, it is a strange world. It's not. It doesn't adhere strictly to the 60s. Uh, so we had, you know, in the first movie, we had an iPad before there were iPads. Um, in fact, I think you know Apple owes me on that one. <laughs> um, but uh, 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 so we have gadgets that are futuristic gadgets. But, for instance, in this movie, we don't have um, portable phones. And, um, uh, you know, in some aspects of this story, it would have made things easier if we'd had cell phones. And in other aspects, it would have made things harder because you always go, well, why don't you just pick up your phone? And, you know, and that gets to be kind of boring story-wise, too. Oh, let me stop and check, you know. <laughs> um, you would have the movie with, the, with all these fantastic characters basically going, <laughs> you know. And so uh, it's always been this blend of, it's kind of 60s futurism, you know, the way a Bond film is or Johnny Quest or something like that. Um, so that part of it has kind of always been influenced by spy movies. Um, but uh, we kind of, I would say we stay generally with the playbook established by the first film. It's just that we're better at doing it now. How much leeway do you give uh, the other teams in the film uh, for an action sequence like the last cycle scene? Leeway? Like how much? Uh, I like, I, I'm heavily into choreographing the shots and I have very strong opinions. That said, um, I try to create an atmosphere where I will get the shot that I want, but if somebody comes up with an alternate shot that they think would be cool, they can persuade me. Um, but I'm not one of these people that goes, you're good at figuring out action sequences, go figure it out. I'm elbows in. I, I have very strong opinions about how I like to see things staged. I mean, ask people. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, so I, you know, some people have said, why am I the only Pixar director that d works alone? And, you know, I, everyone else, there are a million different ways to make a film, and, and one of the great things about this company is that it allows for that and accommodates that. But I always look at the other filmmakers and I go, why would you give up any part of this movie? Why would you give that up? Why would you give it to someone else to do? And they just wave at me like, shut up, you know? <laughs> so that's the best way to handle me. Just tell me to shut up. But one thing I would say is because of the limited schedule, and on the first movie, you were able to choreograph a lot of that stuff very in storyboarding. In storyboarding. And on this, we had to move fast. Yeah, so folks were throwing a lot of stuff up there and bringing it back to you. And, and you know, there are a lot of good ideas that I used. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a, a, a opposed to uh, other people's notions. I just want to make sure that I get mine in first. <laughs> yeah. There's, there was a very interesting idea in the first movie about what makes someone special uh -huh. or Exploring, you know, if everyone is super, then no one is super, and those sorts of things. It, to you, what is, what are the, what's the idea or ideas that this movie is exploring? Um, it explores a lot of ideas. I don't like to talk about the ideas as if that was the reason I made the movie was to push some agenda. It's more like you create something that's hopefully is fun and entertaining, and then there are places where you can put 
little ideas here and there that that, that add dimension to to it. So um, the first most important mission of the first movie was to entertain the crap out of people. And the second thing was, oh, and we have some other things we'd like to comment on, and some of them is the role of, of uh, men and women, uh, fathers and mothers. Uh, you know, how, are teen how do teenagers view the world? Um, uh, you know, uh, what, what, you know, midlife crisis, that kind of stuff. And so there were a lot of little things kind of buried in the movie. Certain things got more attention. That thing got uh, uh, attention. Um, but uh, we have uh, things about, uh, again, exploring the roles of men and women, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the importance of fathers participating, um, the importance of uh, uh, allowing women to also express themselves through work and, and that they're just as vital as men are. And, 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 and uh, there's uh, aspects of, um, you know, uh, being controlled by screens. Um, um, there's uh, talk, uh, feelings about uh, um, you know the difficulties of parenthood. You know that parenting is a is a heroic act. Um, all of those things are kind of in this movie. But if I start to single out one of them and say this movie is about that, it doesn't give you an accurate picture of the movie. It makes it sound like we're having broccoli and not dessert. You know, <laughs> and uh, you know I don't mind nutrition, but I'd like to have it in dessert if possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, in the approximately 22 minutes of the film that we did see, there was some arguably some amazing vocal acting between Craig T. Nelson and Holly and all, all other sorts of folks. Who do you think in the vocal booth this time really took it to the next level from the old guard and then also the, the new people that are coming up? Um, you know, there's no weak link in, in, you know, I'm the worst person to ask because I think they're all just fantastic. Um, I would say that when I was an animator, um, I really hoped that I would have a good soundtrack to animate to because what takes an actor, uh, you know, five seconds to say may take an animator three weeks to animate. And they have to listen to that dialogue over and over and over and over. And if it's flat and boring, you just want to kill yourself. But if there's dimension to the line reading, something to grab onto and explore, you can dive deep on a single line. And, and it's uh, endlessly fascinating. So uh, I, I co try to collect the kind of soundtracks that I would want if I were an animator. And uh, all of our actors delivered. Of the new actors, Bob Odenkirk and and uh, Catherine Keener and uh, Sophia Bush, just kick it out through the roof. There's a character named Void who is a new superhero mm -hmm. uh, of the wannabes, and she admires Helen and is kind of a Helen groupie. And uh, I described her to the animators as like we had this dog that uh, <laughs> that uh, was this this. Uh, very big, powerful dog, and it only had two settings, and one was in your face, love me, love me, love me, love me, love me, love me, and when you said, finally, get off, it was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and then you go, oh, it's okay, and then, I love me, love me, love me, love me, and it, she's a little bit like that, where she's always kind of leaning in a little too much, and is a little too ready to ask you 10 million questions, and it's a, it's a fun character, it's, I've never seen that before in a super superhero movies. So, uh, so we're always trying to juice it up. But I, I love our voice cast. And I loved returning to working with Holly and Craig and, and Sarah. And we have a new Dash uh, who is amazing. Just just every bit as good as, as the first Dash who was also amazing. And um, Jonathan I, Banks. Was Jonathan really Banks, uh, uh, the, the one who did uh, um, our voice, uh, Bud Lucky, who did the voice for Rick Dicker, had um, he was sick, and then he, he's since uh, died. Um, we had to replace him, 
and uh, we got Jonathan Banks. I'm a huge Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul fan. Uh, so he took over the role of Rick Dicker. And as Walker says, uh, the first Rick Dicker, you can't imagine that he possibly could have killed a man. And, and this Dicker, you, you could accept that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, but Jonathan Maybe Banks more than is, one, you know? <laughs> is a wonderful actor, and he's really great as Rick Dicker. So I, I would love to tell you that uh, uh, what one person was excellent above all other, but they're all on that level to me. I'm the worst person to ask. And then there's E. No, no, there is not E. <laughs> um, so, Pixar obviously has a motto of story being king and everything is done in service of the story. It's been 14 years since the first movie came out, so can you talk about how the story kind of developed in your mind and maybe some of the ideas that didn't make it into this movie and how it evolved? <laughs> We don't have enough time to discuss the ideas that didn't make it into this movie. Um, you know, uh, the two ideas that were in my head as the first movie was ending, like, oh, this would be interesting, is a role switch between Bob and Helen and uh, showing Jack-Jack's powers and exploring them and making Jack-Jack a main character rather than a side character. And... Uh, the other ideas, those were in from the beginning and never left the project. Uh, what changed is the plot, the superhero, you know, villain plot, plot, and that shifted endlessly, and it drove me insane. And uh, uh, because I always was faced with the release date, and if something didn't work, I couldn't sit there and, and try to bang on it. I had to throw it away immediately and go to another idea that solved some of the issues that the other first idea didn't have. So uh, uh, that half of the story was shifting always. Great, thank yeah. you. Well, the things that don't make first for- Oh, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so that was the interview. <laughs> and I think the thing that really stood out to me is Brad's honesty or candor. Um, with this being a sequel, he had a, he had a little bit of you know defense to play as far as people you know coming with him with those types of questions why do the sequel and when did you think of this and right. all this other stuff so he doesn't slip up um, you know so he's playing a little bit of defense but like I said before he doesn't slip up and reveal anything he doesn't want to which is crazy because he's in the weeds on it um, I enjoyed the extra notes about Ratatouille mm-hmm. that there was only two lines and two shots from the original film that made it into that movie which makes me wonder if it was like anyone can cook yeah, I mean, obviously everybody was curious, but yeah. I'm glad nobody asked that question because yeah, well, we're, we're not there for not, that. Yeah, right. But I wanted to know. <laughs> I'd love to just go out to dinner with him and be like, "So, can you tell us?" <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I thought that was cool. Um, I was beyond thrilled to ask a question. Um, that's my goal in every one of these sessions, but mm-hmm. it was a big goal in this one. And I was eating lunch with some Pixar employees when the group. The, our press group started going upstairs for the meeting and I was like, uh oh. So I had to like close up shop with them real quick with him yeah. and get my lunch to the recycling, the the plate and tray and everything, and uh get upstairs. And by the time I got there, there wasn't any room in the first like ten rows you of seats. And back. it was pretty thin, like as far as number of seats across, so I was closer to the back. And uh so I luckily, when I walked in, though, I put my recorder on the table right in front of Brad. So hopefully you guys liked the audio quality of that because I put it right in front of him and then spread the um, mics out a little mm-hmm. bit to to touch on Nicole and uh, where I thought John and Nicole were going to sit. And luckily it worked out. But so I was in the back, so I just had to hit record and hope it went well because I couldn't check my levels or anything. Um, but regardless, um, the moderator was looking towards the front of the audience which I appreciated from the sense that it's being recorded Mm because people in the back could be asking questions quietly. Um, But I had to keep nudging my way forward and like standing up and like raising my hand. And so finally one of the other PR people went and said, you should really just let this guy ask a question (laughs) because he's been raising his hand since the first question. And I was the second to last. And the last one, he basically just was like one minute answer. Mm -hmm. It was a quick one. So I was thrilled about that. Um, the vocal booth stuff is something that we're always 
always interested in. Yeah, I mean, you just want to know what the characters are doing. And like I said, I was trying to, I wasn't trying to ever trick anybody into revealing anything, but I was interested to see if he was going to say like, oh, I can now also say that so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so are doing voices. Mm -hmm. But nope, he just stuck to Catherine Keener, Bob Odenkirk, and Sophia Bush. I think I said that earlier. Yes. But yeah, he just kept it to that. So I thought that was really, uh, it was cool. Yeah. And I was really, I felt... I felt glad that I was able to get that question in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you liked the part about Honey. Yes. That it's a funnier character. It is. When being like hid, not hidden, but, but off screen. Off screen, like yeah. in the next room. Right. Rather than having her character made. Yes. And I thought it was cool that he's like, well, we made a character and she her rig is used on someone else. It, but yeah, I think I think it's a much better. Not that it's a gag, but it's just funnier. It's to comedic hear, relief. Yeah. yeah. Just like a, a nagging kind of wife just right. like in the other room. <laughs> I like he's just rolling his eyes yeah. like, you know, and we even saw that in the trailer that mm-hmm. was just released. Right. Um, so, yeah, if you haven't seen that trailer and our reaction to that not a reaction trailer but our breakdown of it where we uh talked for two hours about a two minute trailer it's always two hours i know (laughs) so yeah if you haven't seen that you can also check that out on our youtube channel so it's just youtube.com forward slash the pixar post or you can go to pixarpost.com and click on the youtube button um but anyways i think that about wraps it up for this one what do you think i think so i think it's a good setup for many more podcasts to come and thanks for bearing with us on our little hiatus there we had a couple things that like always life gets in the way right right yeah, we had you know, our up moments where it's yeah. like we kept cracking open the, the our adventure falls uh, the, yeah the, the yeah, jar jug yeah so anyways uh happy to be back and thanks for bearing with us hopefully you enjoyed this interview with brad nicole and john and we will see you next time so in the meantime be sure to follow us on all of our social media channels twitter facebook instagram youtube pinterest and subscribe to our podcast on itunes overcast or wherever you get your podcasts lastly if you like today's show let us know rate us on itunes leave a comment on our site or send us an email info at pixarpost.com signing off as usual i'm tj and i'm julie and be sure to stay tuned to pixarpost.com all week for the latest pixar news Bye bye